the godfathers of Purdue fan sites, BoiledSports.com. This is Boiler Dowd's QuickCast. Purdue dominates at UConn. Did we learn anything? Let's talk about it. Today's QuickCast is brought to you by Martin Vintage. Martin Vintage, enter Boiled at checkout for 15% off. Martin Vintage is a Purdue family. Check them out, martinvintage.com. Mom, thanks for watching. So as you know, if you watched the game, if you checked on the post-game highlights, uh, you didn't see anything here because we dropped the ball here at Boiled Sports, but I'm here to catch you up real quickly. Uh, Purdue really, really decimated UConn, an already beleaguered team. UConn struggled mightily uh, in about every facet of the game with the exception of very early in the game. Purdue did not look good offensively on the first drive. The defense kind of was not great either. Uh, yet UConn couldn't score. But quickly, things got into shape for Jack Plummer and company. Jack, in just two quarters of work, finished 16-20, 245 yards, four touchdowns, zero interceptions. O'Connell came in in the third quarter, went 9 of 11, 86 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions. That's a combined 25 of 31 for 331 yards and six TDs in under three quarters of work. On top of that, we got to see uh, we got to see Alamo play. Uh, he, all he did was hand over the ball, hand, pardon me, hand off the ball, and we got to see Burton uh, throw a few pa- passes, scramble a bit. But it's pretty amazing to see four quarterbacks play in one game, uh, totally by the coach's choice. I can't emphasize this enough. UConn is not a very good team. In fact, as I watched on TV, I was sure that Purdue is playing better competition in the spring game when they go into the two deeps. UConn not only isn't good, but after the long David Bell touchdown where he just kind of matriculated across the field and scored uh, in an improbable fashion, uh, it looked like UConn's spirit was broken. Sure enough, that was about it. Speaking of David Bell, he had six receptions, 121 yards, three touchdowns. Uh, Durham, Rice, and Sheffield all joined him with a TD. Uh, Doru played very well. He averaged six uh, over six yards a carry. He had a touchdown as well. Uh, his his pal in the backfield, uh, of course, Xander Horvath, was injured, uh, and this is the biggest negative by far of the game. Horvath will now be out four to eight weeks with a broken fibula. That was a, a pretty big deal. It probably changed the way Coach Brom um, dealt with substitutions and how he handled the second half. Uh, Nine players ran the ball coming out of the backfield. Thirteen receivers had a catch. Nine receivers had multiple catches. An incredible stat line for your Purdue Boilermakers. There were no fumbles. There were no interceptions for Purdue. uh, And I only counted one dropped pass. Also, Anish and Jay uh, got a win, which is noteworthy. Um, The biggest victory of the game was not just the score, the 49-0 score, Purdue over UConn. The biggest victory is probably seeing second and third stringers play so darn well. Those guys um, executed. They didn't just come in and kind of stand pat. They uh, they did a really good job executing, whether it was receivers, offensive linemen, defensive linemen, linebackers, safeties, corners. Everybody looked really good. Heck, even punters. Purdue had three punters uh, punt the ball on just four punts, which is an incredible stat in itself. Of course, next week, Purdue will play Notre Dame at Notre Dame, which has been one of Purdue's worst places to visit historically. The last win came when Kyle Orton and Taylor Stubblefield lit him on fire. Um, We don't have Orton and Stubblefield this year. There's no combo like that. But uh, Snack and Bell are starting to look the part, and uh, maybe they can do some damage. Of course, Plummer will start. 
Um, he's looked uh, under control every game. He's completed 73% of his passes. Um, he has no interceptions. He's in the top 10 in the nation in completion percentage right now as we head in there. Uh, Doru will start at running back with Horvath out. Uh, Downey will, will, will come off the bench, uh, spell him, and then you'll probably see Anthrop uh, play running back after that if needed. We've seen Anthrop in the backfield quite a few times this year. We also saw some interesting uh, – Things last week, we saw Marcellus Moore even played running back a couple downs, and um, we're not going to see anything like that versus Notre Dame. Let's let's make no bones about it. But there is a chance um, you'll see Anthrop coming out of the backfield. One more thing I want to talk about UConn before I move on completely to Notre Dame is that another big goal that was reached was Purdue got to play uh, some of the guys that you wanted to see. We talked about this on the Handsome Hour. Uh, Carl Loftus had four tackles. Wahlberg had full, four tackles. Marcellus Moore had his first. Uh, offensive touch, a uh, reception. Um, he's a guy that I've been interested in. I just want to see him get in the open field one time, um, and we haven't been able to do that just yet. Um, ESPN's predictor has uh, has Notre Dame has a 72% chance of winning. Uh, that's, uh, that's pretty commanding, obviously, and that's based on their power index. Purdue doesn't rank high there. But um, Purdue does rank high according to some of the computers. According to the Massey ratings, uh, Purdue is 14th of the nation, which is incredible. Obviously, they don't have many um, uh, data points. They need more of that. But uh, Purdue does uh, Purdue does rank highly according to some computers. And why wouldn't they? They've 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 got two wins. They have a dominant win, another win that looks solid and more solid even after you watch Oregon State beat the hell out of uh, Hawaii on Saturday. Uh, if you're on campus, check out AJ's Burgers, Beef, and Beer. That's eataj's.com. Great Purdue people. Check them out. Um, Notre Dame, they struggled versus Toledo. They struggled mightily. In fact, Toledo looked like they had the game won as they took the lead with, I think, under two minutes left. Notre Dame went right down the field, scored in regulation, and won the game. Uh, Notre Dame's previous opponent, of course, Florida State, um, they are – uh, not good. How you say not good? They lost to Jacksonville State after uh, Notre Dame and and Florida State uh, played pretty much an even game. And um, of course, Jacksonville State uh, was beaten by UAB in Week One, thirty-one to zero. And UAB is not a good team, uh, like I referenced before. They have a quarterback that looks like he's about my height and build, which is never good. The ball looks huge in his hands, and he looks to struggle to push the ball down the field. Notre Dame, of course, has, um, has Cone starting at quarterback. Cone was a really good quarterback when he had Jonathan Taylor in the backfield at Wisconsin. Last time you saw him as a starter was 2019. Um, he lost the starting battle to a freshman, um, and then he transferred to Notre Dame. Over the this season and his last season at Wisconsin, this season obviously uh, very incomplete, only two games in, but he completed about 69% of his passes, awfully solid there. But, uh, as I've told you, I'm still very skeptical of Cone as a quarterback. I think he's a fine game manager. But if you get in his face, he struggles, and he's shown it a couple times. He'll throw off his back foot. He'll throw into double coverage. Um, I, uh, he's great when he's throwing uh, deep balls. He, he, can th- he can put those on the money. Um, Notre Dame has some speed on the outside. But in an unusual fashion, Notre Dame really doesn't have a big target on the outside. They don't have a big receiver. Uh, their best big receiver, of course, would uh, be their tight end. His name's Mayer. Um, he's probably uh, he's one of their best offensive players. Um, averages around 100 yards a game receiving. And he's only a sophomore, uh, but he's six foot four. Uh, their tallest receiver is six foot two. His name's Austin, um, and he's uh, had some big catches. But they don't have that big possession receiver that Notre Dame has had so much in the last decade. Um, they're starting running back. Uh, his name's Williams. He's only five foot nine. Uh, he's averaging under 60 yards a game and under four yards a carry. So it's not the dominant um, uh, group up front uh, that, that I think sets the tone for Notre Dame. They've got a, co- a couple really, really good offensive linemen, but as a unit, they're not what they usually are. Um, they have two preseason All-Americans in a guy named uh, Patterson, another one named Madden. Uh, Kane Madden, of course, is a transfer from Marshall. Um, he's a fifth-year guy, and Patterson is a is a normal fourth-year senior. Both those guys are really solid. After they get past these two guys, though, they drop off in experience pretty quickly. They still have a lot of size because they're Notre Dame. A lot of 6'4", 315-pound type, type guys with long arms. 
uh, future NFL type linemen, but they are under experience. So a little bit like Purdue, they're trying to figure some things out as a unit. Um, Purdue, of course, got to figure a couple things out last week because they uh, they played together quite a bit in that in that uh, glorified scrimmage versus UConn. A guy that I am worried about, if I was going to say one person on Notre Dame that bothers me when I watch Notre Dame play, I've talked about this in the Handsome Hour and other times, is Kyle Hamilton. Um, he's, a, he's a great uh, safety for Notre Dame, long, lanky, um, free safety. He has a nose for the ball. He is always in the right place. He's amazing on delay blitzes. Kyle Hamilton is a, is a very, very good player, um, and he, like I said, is always in the right place, good open field tackler. Um, he's, he's not uh, a menacing uh, physical pre- presence because he's, he's just long, lean, kind of like a gazelle, um, but not put together like some of the prototypical safeties that we've seen come out of Notre Dame in the past. Go to Gridiron Metalworks now and find the perfect gift for that person on your list who's so hard to shop for. Enter Boiled at checkout for 15% off. GridironMetalworks.com Tell Derek we love him. So how do I feel about the game? I still feel the same. I still have a hard time believing Purdue can win in South Bend because it's still Notre Dame versus Purdue in South Bend. You saw last week a couple questionable calls down the end. That that stuff seems to happen at Notre Dame. Um, it's, a, it's a tough place to play for a lot of people, but especially tough for Purdue. We'll talk a little bit more about it on the Handsome Hour later in the week. We're planning on recording or maybe going live on Thursday. We're not sure. If you want to send us questions, you can do that on Twitter. Um, and uh, we, we'd love to answer them and, and look forward to interacting with it that way. And we'll probably have it posted uh, on Friday, maybe a kind of a mini predicto in there as well. I do appreciate you tuning in. And um, uh, while I don't feel great about the Notre Dame game, I feel better about it than I did a week ago. I can tell you that much. It's not really so much to do with Purdue just handling their business in UConn as much as it is uh, Notre Dame does not look like a top 10 team to me. I don't think there's any way you can deny that if you're a Notre Dame fan or someone who is just an outside observer like myself when I watched Notre Dame recently. We'll see. We'll see on Saturday. And um, I'm excited to see this game because I think it's a good measuring stick, if nothing else. And um, uh, that's, I think that's what we're looking for at this point of the season. After Notre Dame, Purdue goes into Big Ten action versus Illinois. And that kickoff has been set for 3.30. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day. God bless you. Hammer down. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. BS all the time.